something we're not getting from the, the mainstream debates and so uh, we hope everybody is prepared to ask a couple of questions that they're not getting answered uh, in uh, on the television debates and so uh, I'm going to start off uh, on foreign policy and so I have a few questions that actually are, are uh, I saw in an article that said these were the don't ask and don't tell six critical foreign policy questions that aren't being raised in the presidential uh, debates and certainly aren't being raised in the in the Senate senatorial one either. The first question. Um, no, are you going to get each a few minutes to, to yeah, talk? Yeah, we're just going to yeah. just introduce okay. ourselves first. Yeah. So we're going to give each of the candidates a couple of minutes to introduce themselves and uh, and then we'll go on to the questions. Let's uh, let's have Tim start first. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, my name is Tim Davis. I am the candidate for the Grassroots Party for United States Senate. The Grassroots Party is a homegrown party here in Minnesota. Started in 1986. Uh, this will be my eighth time of running, um, so I'm not necessarily new to running for office. Um, but uh, we're here to uh, talk about issues. So thank you for inviting us and. Uh, we welcome the discussion. Okay, uh, I'm Stephen Williams. I'm the Independence Party nominee for U.S. Senate. Uh, for the last, well, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming, and I hope we can make this a, a good dialogue between, you know, not just us three, but all of us here. Uh, for for 32 years now, I've been a farmer in southern Minnesota, uh, but I did grow up actually in South Minneapolis and spent a lot of time. Uh, uh, bike riding and running along the parkways. And that, I think, has uh, been kind of an inspiration for what I feel we need to do in that the parkways were something that were set aside for everyone in, you know, in this state. They were set aside by stewards, you know, people who were, were trying to save something for the future. And I think we, that's what we need to seek out you know, in, our, in our government and in our, our lives every day is to try to build for the future rather than steal for it, steal from it, excuse me. Now we're, we're, stealing, we're stealing from it. And uh, like, I say, the, like I say, the parkways, uh, I spent a lot of time there. And down on the farm, I've been restoring native plants, uh, improving the, the wildlife habitat, again, being stewards. Now we also need to be stewards of our economy and of our human resources, and as well as our natural resources. You know, so that's basically the, the basis for, for my uh, campaign is to try to build for the future rather than steal from it. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to first of all thank the other two candidates for being here. Um, thank you all here for being here. Um, and before I go into the discussion of what we're going to have here, I'd like to give a big shout out 
to a Minnesota hero, someone that you're not hearing about. Her name is Sherry Honkala. Sherry Honkala is the Green Party presidential vice presidential candidate. I'm a Rocky Anderson supporter, but I'm very, very proud of Sherry because Sherry was just arrested outside of the fake debates and at the Hofestra University in New York, New York State. Um, and Sherry is from here. Sherry was actually born and raised in North Minneapolis. Not a lot of people know that. Sherry was the uh, founder of the Poor, people, Poor People's Eno Economic Human Rights Campaign, a wonderful organization. So big shout out to, to Sherry and to indeed Dr. Jill Stein for, um, for actually standing up for well, something that we don't have. Sherry right now, by the way, is being interviewed on Russian Times today, talking about how we need to bring democracy to America. So with that said, um, my name is Michael Kaplan. <coughs> um, and in fact, um, with our live stream here, um, this is actually going to be heard outside of this room. And it's going to go to one spot, and it's going to be looped over and over and over until the elections are over, or as I like to call them, these selections. <laughs> so my name is Michael Kaplan. I'm a very proud, um, decades-long uh, activist in the issue of peace, justice, me corporate media control, um, and justice and equality. Um, I'm a registered nurse. I have um, worked for many, many years now as a nurse. I moved here to Minnesota about 17 years ago. I was born in California, but I was actually raised um, in Northern Ireland. I lived in Northern Ireland from 1969 um, until uh, 1984. And I lived in the middle of that turmoil. And that experience, by the way, um, living in Northern Ireland, has made me the dedicated anti-war activist that I am today. Because I've lived in war. I know exactly how wrong, how wrong wars are. I know what wars do to the soul. And not just the soul of the individual, but the soul of a nation, too. Northern Ireland, even now, is still traumatized over the 30-year conflict that we had there. So um, why I'm running for office is very simple. I recognize something. We don't have a democracy. We don't have one. We have a facade of a democracy. We have a pretense of a democracy. But we don't actually have a representative democracy. And the goal of this campaign for the Senate is to allow us, the people of Minnesota, the space to get an actual corporate free democracy. That's the whole purpose of this. It's the whole point. Once this race is done, then it's up to the people of Minnesota what you want to do with that. We had a long series of goals, strategic goals, very well thought out, very deliberately done. So that once this race is over, then from there it's up to the people of Minnesota. Do you want to have a democracy? Because if you do, you've got the tools for it. My name is Michael Calvin. Thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to start the ball rolling, but you know, think of some questions. Uh, maybe we will kind of mix up the foreign policy and not have the whole one bunch of them at, at once. Make it more interesting. So the first question is, uh, let me uh, lead up to it, but the question is, is there an end game for the global war on terror? And of course, the incumbent has uh, voted for funding for the wars, uh, I believe, every time. Uh, just recently, a group of senators, including uh, the incumbent Senator Klobuchar, did, uh, was not so enthusiastic about continuing the war in Afghanistan. So, um, but otherwise has voted for the wars. The Bush's global war on terror, other than uh, dropping the name, uh, Obama kept up. And the jewel in the crown of the Bush era, uh, Offshore imprisonment, Guantanamo, still houses over 160 prisoners held without trial or hope for a, or a plan of what to do with them. While the U.S. pulled its troops out of Iraq, mostly because the Iraqi allies flexed their muscles a bit and threw us out, the war in Afghanistan stumbles on. Drone strikes and other forms of conflict continue in the same places Bush <coughs> tormented, Yemen, Somalia, and Pakistan. And it's clear that northern Mali is heading our way. A huge national security state has been codified in a host of new or expanded intelligence agencies under the Homeland Security um, umbrella. So candidates, the question is, what's the end game for all this? Even in the worst days of the Cold War, when it seemed impossible to imagine, there was still a goal, the end of the Soviet Union. Are we really consigned to the global war on terror under whatever name or no name at all as an infinite state of existence is it now as American as apple pie? And uh, let's start in the middle uh, with uh, Steve. Steve. <laughs> so. 
Uh, that's not at all a pointed question, is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, terror, the, the war on terror is, is being used to basically limit our democracy. It's, there's a, it's a good question is who the, who the real terrorist is. Uh, yes, I mean, we had a tragic thing happen uh, 10 years ago. Uh, 5,000 people died. But in response, uh, in the wars we've had over 6,000 American soldiers killed and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and Af Afghanis killed. It, it, and the, the response is totally disproportionate to, to you know, what happened. Uh, we have to accept that there's a certain amount of risk that comes with freedom. We can't eliminate all, all the risk in our lives. Uh, we will end up closing ourselves up in our own prison. And the ter they could always have a, they could always use terrorists to get us to give up our freedom, ter the threat of terrorism to give up our freedom. And we must learn uh, to resist that, you know, fear, that fear mongering. Uh, as far as the, the war in Afghanistan, it's, it's time to quit talking about it or planning about what we're going to do. It's, I would just be very happy if they would announce they had pulled out. You know, the, the, the president would just say, I'm going to start pulling people out and then I'll tell the people when we're done. And, you know, let's not talk about, uh, you know, the end anymore. Let's just, let's just do it. Uh, and, uh, I mean, terrorism is a real thing, and there are things that we need to do. And, and one of the most effective things we did to fight terrorism, more than anything else, is very simple. Uh, we secured the cockpits of the airlines. <laughs> and, but we, and that, that was a very low cost, but a very effective solution. It probably did more than all the, the billions or trillions of dollars that have been spent. You know, there are simple things that we could do. To pre, you know, to reduce terrorism, but we, we can't expect to eliminate it. And if we try to, we're only going to imprison ourselves. Would you vote against uh, funding of uh, the wars continued? That's very um, you know, no, almost nobody in Congress does that. Votes against funding. Well, and that's uh, vote against funding. Uh, they didn't ra they didn't vote to raise our taxes, did they? And this is one thing that more than anything else. I mean, one of the things, but this is one thing that really enrages me is as a nation, we asked our men and women of the military to go and sacrifice their blood. You know, about 6,000 have died. But no one asked us just to, to raise the, the taxes to pay, to just pay for the, the economic costs. But we're willing, if we're not willing to uh, ask the people to raise the taxes to pay for the war, we have no right to ask our young men and women to shed their blood for a war, <coughs> and uh, so I would not, uh, you know, I would not vote for any spending. How about Michael? You know, thank you, Colin, for a very, 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 very softball question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious when I say it because it is just a completely softball question, especially um, with myself and with my own experiences. You see. I happen to know a little bit about terrorism. I lived in a state plagued by terrorism for 15 years. And here's the thing that you will never hear any United States Senator, any US Congressman, or any other selected official talk about, the real causes of terrorism. The cause of terrorism in this country is very simple. It's US foreign policy. That's the cause of terrorism. That's what drove in Northern Ireland. The IRA weren't fighting the British just because they, they have this anti-British, don't like, no, it's because there was an, a foreign government occupying their country. What they call terrorism is simply people standing up and fighting back and protecting their own country and their own people, which everybody has a right to do, by the way. And um, so the simple answer to that is that the way to end terrorism is to take away the causes of terrorism. And the causes of terrorism is US foreign policy. And in fact, even to go even a step further than that, the reason that we've heard this lie, they hate us because they hate our freedoms. You've heard that lie from these <clears throat> corporate politicians taking corporate money with a corporate flag on their pen, talking about the, this issue. 
And yet our government has funded human rights abusers all over the world. Our government, the United States government, has been funding human rights abusers. Not a very well-known fact, but in, in, uh, in Tahrir Square in Egypt, during the Egyptian uprising, those gas canisters that were being fired <coughs> by the e Egyptian military and police were made in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, their birthplace of American democracy. That's where they were made. And, that, and those gas canisters were funded by the US government. Our government funds human rights abusers all over the world. You know, whether it's Egypt, whether it's, it's um, Israel, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's Colombia, whether it's Chile, you name it. These governments are actually brutalizing their own people on our dime, on our dime. Our money, our taxpayer money is paying for this. And you will, ne actually you will see, occasionally you'll see a very rare politician stand up and speak the truth about that, but they're very, very rare. And in fact, when you talk about the war itself, one thing we've got to get really honest about is that the wars are completely bipartisan. Democrats will talk peace and vote for war. Senator Klobuchar is a perfect example of this. They'll talk peace while they continue to vote for the war funding. That's the reality. I remember in the start of the Afghan war, the st actually, not, let me rephrase that. At the start of the Af Afghan occupation, it wasn't a war, it was an occupation. There was one member of Congress stood up and said no to that war. Her name was Congresswoman Barbara Lee. And I remember, and by the, that, that means that all the Democrats and all the Republicans were voting for the Afghan war. All of them, except for Barbara Lee. I remember being part of the peace movement. And the chant at the time was, Barbara Lee speaks for me. So the problem is that we have got to come to grips with the reality of why we have wars. And it all comes down to one simple fact, follow the money. The corporate money that are behind these wars are also the ones that are buying our politicians. Which gets to this idea again. Okay, and, and I, but, but yes, I will, I will fight to the death for, for, to end war funding. That's how we got to Vietnam. All right, Tim Davis. You're not going to end the war on terror, because terror is not a enemy. Terror is an idea. We're in a warfare state. We don't have a welfare state. We have a warfare state. You cut military, you cut jobs all over the United States. But that's the price we have to pay. The reality is we're in Afghanistan not because the Taliban bombed the World Trade Center. Actually, the World Trade Center 9-11 was probably an inside job. People need to ask for the new investigation of 9-11. Nobody's explained building number seven falling down, or the physics of two buildings falling straight down, or three buildings, one not even hit with a plane. So we went to war on, priest, on, on a precipice that was not even there. We must ask ourselves, with all the money that we spent on defense, why couldn't we defend those buildings? Good question, but here's the problem. We went to that because we were attacked. Americans love war as long as we win. We don't like losing. And we've lost this war. We've lost the Iraq war. Obama did not get out of, out, out of Iraq. That was done under Bush. They signed the agreement. The troops will leave at the end of 2011. He upped the war in Afghanistan, and it's because of oil. Remember, Karzai was an official of UNICAL. Mm -hmm. There's a pipeline that they have to run through Afghanistan to Pakistan because they don't want to run it the other way, through Iran. We are in there for oil. We are fighting a resource war. Mm -hmm. That is why we are surrounding China and the Middle East, because they have the oil and China is buying resources throughout Africa. That's why we're in Northern Africa now, as you mentioned, going into Mali. That's why we destroyed Libya, because Gaddafi had gold and was going to bring the dinar right. throughout Africa. That's right. We have to destroy, and that's exactly why we're against Iran. Iran is now trading oil with India and China with gold, no longer the petrodollar that controls the world. It's our currency, because we're currency, our currency is the world reserve. 
So we're fighting for the resources to control the world for the remainder of our lives and for the future because the resources are running out. And one thing we don't want to talk about is the fact that we're running out of all the resources that we have to continue our life as it is. Terror is just an idea. Oh, what is terror? You're fearful. Well, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. Mm -hmm. So the people who are killing our soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq are defending their country. We are there as the oppressors. We are there as the terrorists. If a drone strike comes in the middle of the night and kills you, that's terrorism. So I would not vote for funding the war. But the real problem that we find ourselves in is when we cut the military, and I have suggested cutting the military by 50%, is we have to deal with the job loss and the uproar <clears throat> amongst the communities around the United States who will be losing jobs because those military jobs are in their neighborhoods. In order to have a bit of a debate, I would suggest that if there's a candidate who disagrees you know, a lot, disagrees a lot with something that another candidate has said, you get maybe 30, 40 seconds to quickly add that at this point if you really took issue with something that was said. Otherwise, we'll just go on to a second question. Um, uh, does Kurt Bills have anything, any comment on this? <laughs> and Kurt, no? Senator Klobuchar? Uh, I will say one thing. Uh, <laughs> since Senator Klobuchar doesn't have anything to say, I'll say <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't really think that the uh, terrorist attacks of 9-11 were an inside job. I, I do think they were planned. But I do think it's very possible that the powers in this country were aware of the plan and let it happen, which there's, there's a, a, bit, a bit of a difference. Um, but uh, that's just something, like I say, the result is, is, is maybe the same, but uh, I don't think that uh, it, was, you know, it was done, uh, it was an inside job, but we maybe let it happen. Tim, Tim mentioned he would cut military spending by 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, do you agree with that amount, or would you cut more or less? But the other two people who didn't. I, I, I will call your 50% and read you another 10%. <laughs> <laughs> I will cut defense spending by 60%. Well, I would like to give, cut it 100%, but I'm being realistic. Yes. I, don't, I don't think that uh, it, our, amongst us three cutting defense is probably something we would all do. Uh, I, I think dickering on the numbers at this point in time is uh, kind of very difficult. It's an idea that, that they need to put out there. You know, if, as I said, I have mentioned on, on several sites and whatnot, 50% is a good number. Now, Gary Johnson is calling for 43%. You know, that, that we can, like I said, dicker on 60% as my rating 10%. It doesn't matter. We need to cut the military budget because what is the military for? We need to only be in wars that are constitutional. Nothing besides God. We have not declared war since World War II. We're on all these military excursions. Obama didn't declare a war in Libya. He just started bombing for, for, because of NATO. We're drone bombing, you know, Somalia, Yemen, and Pakistan, and who knows what else, probably Mali next. And, you know, and the, the drones are great because we just play games now. I mean, we teach our kids video, violent video games, so they can run drones and go, oh, look, we kill them. <laughs> Whoa, that was fun. It's ridiculous, but that's what we're doing. Actually, I'd actually like to counter um, something to actually both these uh, two candidates uh, just said. Um, first of all, Stephen, um, in regards to September 11th, number one, I was a nurse who actually treated us with a victim from a Pentagon attack. Okay? And let me tell you, we cannot say that 9-11 was an inside job. We cannot say that. But what we can say is that there's a whole bunch of very, very, very serious unanswered questions about September 11th, including Building 7, including all the things that the media don't talk about. So, you know, we cannot say that 9 11 was an inside job, but I can tell you one thing we can say that we definitely need an actual, real, independent investigation, not the whitewash that we got. Um, Tim, you talked about, um, you know, the cutting the, the military 50%, 60%, whichever. 
and how that would cause this huge sucking vacuum of jobs. I actually disagree with you on that one, and I'll tell you why I say that. We actually could have the military be cut by that amount, and we could have the whole industry, the whole weapons manufacturing industry, very quickly revamped into creating peacetime jobs. Because here's the thing, we've done in the past the other way around. We were a peace-based economy, relatively peace-based economy, in the 1930s and 40s, and then we had World War II, and this country very dramatically shifted into a war-based economy. And what I'm saying to you is that given the crisis that we're facing, especially with global warming, and with the need for alternative energy sources, we so very easily could, we got to think outside the box, I, but look at the real possibilities. We could actually have this country very rapidly shift into an actual peace-based um, 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 in, uh, economy where we actually have manufacturing creating alternative energy, whether it's building wind turbines or whether it's building a new transit system or whatever, whatever it is that we decide. We can do it. The big problem that we have at the moment is that we don't have the political will for that. And the reason we don't have the political will for it is because the, the weapons manufacturers who own GE, who own MSNBC, who do nothing but pimp the Democratic Party, own the political process. And that's where we've got to get past this whole corporate, that's why this stuff is so important. Having a corporate corrupted de democracy is destroying our country, it's destroying our government, and it's destroying our world. And that's why building up an alternative to the rotten, corporate corrupted, pro-war, two-party system is so critically important. Our very future depends upon it. So I actually disagree with you. I think we can, given the right situation, right circumstances and the right political will, create an actual peace-based economy. You're not. Uh, uh, I, I just If you two go on, I'll move to the side. <laughs> Uh, no, I, President, I mean, getting, we've covered a lot of ground and, and maybe gone beyond the questions at times. Uh, but President Eisenhower warned us uh, in his farewell address to the nation uh, about the, the military industrial complex. And we have totally failed to heed his warning. Okay, not only do we now have the military industrial complex, we have the financial industrial complex, which is actually even bigger than the military industrial complex as well as the healthcare yes. industrial complex, yes. which, both, which both dwarf the military industrial <laughs> complex. But getting back just to the to the to the military, I, I believe there's a lot of, of cutting we can do. I, I don't care to try to I mean I'm gonna need more information that it will have as a senator before I've come on any, you know, hard numbers, but I'm I'm not gonna try to come up with the numbers. But I believe, like I say, President Eisenhower, the general who won the Second World War, was was very right in it, his concerns were, were, were totally ignored. And uh, we need to get back to, to his type of thinking. He'd spend on defense, but he wasn't going to spend one more dime than necessary. And we're spending a lot of unnecessary dimes. We have his thinking here in this room, by the way. And, and I just want to basically say that uh, I was answering the question, Mike, um, I mean, you did not allow me to say what I would do with those 50 percent cuts, but the jobs is also how we rebuild this economy. Yeah, no, and one thing, we don't have a corporate democracy. We have an uh, industrial politics, but there's, there's a big difference between politics and democracy. You know, even the former so Soviet Union had politics. Uh, we have all sorts of politics in this country, and I think that's a problem for the people of this nation. Just because we have politics, we think that means that ha we have democracy. Okay, there's a big difference, you know, and we have to get back to you know, it's we the people, not we the industries. Right. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, those comments on foreign policy. Uh, does anyone uh, have a good question on, let's say, domestic policy this time? Yes. <coughs> Deb Ramage, acting chair of the uh, Twin Cities Local Democratic Association of America. I have a question that's uh, very important to our program in DSA, Democratic Socialists. The student debt crisis, I'd like to know from each of the candidates what your thoughts on the student debt crisis, uh, if you have any creative solutions, what, you, what kind of legislation you would uh, push for in the Senate to 
solve the student debt crisis and um, save an entire generation from financial and educational ruin. Let's start with uh, uh, Steve in the middle. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, it, uh, a good education is priceless. That doesn't mean we should bankrupt ourselves to obtain one. And, uh, uh, oh, can I just interject? You're not allowed to declare bankruptcy on Steve. No, I, I, I'm, I'm aware, I'm That's aware of that. That's a really key part of my well, question, by the way. First, I mean, I would, I would like uh, <laughs> the, like some of the institutions, educational institutions, who are basically ripping off the student and the taxpayer at the same time by in this program, I'd like the, the administrators and the, the teachers of those institutions to have to hold those bonds in their retirement portfolios. I mean, that would be a, a good solution right there. Um, it is a problem. Uh, and like I say, education is important, but we have let uh, the industry, again, this is industrial politics, uh, set the rules to, for, for their own self-serving interests. Uh, that said, students have to have take a good hard look and evaluate what they expect to get from this education that they're signing, mortgaging their future. Uh, I don't know, uh, I mean we need student loans, but I'd, I think we could close down some institutions that have been shown to be just rip, you know, ripping off the student and the taxpayer, where they spend all their money promoting, uh, you know, recruiting students. They, they spend half, you know, the, the fee just on recruitment, and then maybe 20% goes into instruction, and then the other 30% goes into administration. You know? And those, we know about those institutions, and we should, we should shut them down. Uh, I can't. Uh, I think there should be maybe partial forgiveness on some of these things, but we, you know, the student has to take a certain amount of responsibility for it. I can't, uh, I can't go along with being able to eliminate it totally, but it's all part of the problem when you have the government getting involved in between, uh, you know, two entities, uh, where one's borrowing the money and the other one's making the profit, and the government's guaranteeing that it's going to work out for both of them. Uh, we have to get rid of that. It's the same thing that happened in the mortgage industry. You have the government guaranteeing it. So the industry, you know, sells, gives mortgages for any price to anyone who, who wants to try it, uh, and it collapses. And we're, we have the same thing here, and I, I do think that there there's probably will need to be some forgiveness uh, of student debts. Uh, precisely, though, I, I can't say, you know, but I, a part, you know, a partial forgiveness. Okay, Michael, what's your thoughts? Okay. Um, well, actually, and I will actually disagree with you, Stephen, is that I think that should be start off with a complete uh, erasing of the, of the current debt, what, what we have now. And um, the reason I say that is because then you can move in. Well, actually, there's two, two separate parts of this, of this uh, question that need to be answered. Number one, I personally believe that all the debt should be rescinded. I personally believe that we should set up a system to have an actual free educational system from the cradle to the grave. If you're 60 years old and you want to get yourself more education, you should have the right to be able to get yourself that further education. That's what I think personally. That's me. But it's not what I think is what's really important here. The answer to the question will be, is, as a senator, that I would listen to the very sage advice of the people groups like Democratic Socialists of America and say, so what do you think I should do as a senator? What kind of, what kind of um, legislation do you want to see put in place? It's not about what I think. This is where I, I go to this whole idea of we do not have a representative democracy and we need one. Actually, we don't have a de representative democratic republic is what we actually don't have. We don't have that right now and we need it. So rather than say what I think we should do, what I think is irrelevant. I'm me, an individual. I'm a nurse. But if I have people approaching me saying, Mike, we need this legislation put in place, and here's what we want, Would you, could you help us craft this? That's my job. My job as a senator 
is to craft what you all want, be it education, be it war, be it the Bill of Rights, whatever it is. It's not what I think. What I think is irrelevant. It's what you all think. But we, see, we the people means we the people. It doesn't mean what, like what it is right now. We the corporations. So my simple answer is, Deb from DSA, tell me what should we do? What should we do with, about the educational system, and how should we how should we take care of this crisis that we're facing right now? All right, Tim. Okay, a couple problems that I disagree with Mike, uh, but a couple of problems exist, and the reason why we have this, and first of all, is the federal government guarantees the loans. So there's no loss for the school, so they can charge whatever they want. If we really want education for the jobs, as they say, well, you have to go to college to get a job, but the jobs aren't out there for the college graduates, and a lot of college graduates don't know what they want to do when they go into college, and they get goofy degrees and have no job prospects whatsoever. There's no guarantee when you go to college that you're going to come out with a degree and get a job. And yet we have to hold these people personally responsible for signing on the line and acquiring that much debt in the belief that somehow magically jobs will poof in front of them and give them thousands of dollars on which they can then repay their loans and move on to the happy ever world. That's a nice dream. It's a nice belief. So the question is, how do we do that? Well, I would suggest perhaps extending school to let's say 14 years. Let's break it up so that the, the last three years, your senior and your, your 13th and 14th year are college preparatory, like community college. Something where you can get an associate's degree so you can have a, a degree of higher learning and we can change the public education system. But until we do that, we're stuck with what we got. And as long as the government is writing checks for everybody, the big banks and the, and the big schools. And as long as these big schools get away with paying their, excuse the expression, goddamn athletes, millions of bucks. They're, they're not they're paying their athletes, but they're paying their coaches. Mm -hmm. They're building humongous stadiums on the taxpayer's dime. We are the ones paying for these student loans. We're the ones backing them up. If the students go bankrupt, which they can't, which they can't. <laughs> We're responsible for those debts. So if we want to get rid of the debts, we're paying for it. Your tax dollars are paying for that. So when Michael says he wants to get rid of the debt, he's raising your taxes. Because somebody's got to pay for that, that debt. Well, where's that debt go? If you're, if you're saying no, where does that debt go? Where does all that money that's accumulated in debt go if we're not paying for it? And if you just erase I, I think it. you don't understand how debt works. But um, Oh, I do understand how debt works, oh, believe me. The fact is that... I understand how debt works, and I understand by, how the economy fiat, works. It is quite possible for the government to say, banks take the loss. Oh, good. Well, then they can start that. when they start with the Wall Street. Well, yeah. that's they don't have to start well, with students. Excuse me, that's where the student debts are. They're bundled into... Exactly, and so is, the, same as the so is your city's debt, and so are your pensions. All of them. So is it all. We could do so like, if you're talking about like student like debt, that's one thing, but students have to be responsible. We no, they don't. They no, don't no, students don't have to be responsible. We're responsible for what students you're do shouting. no matter what. You're yeah. not thinking. That's, that's no, no. Students have to be responsible. If we want them to go to college and get an education, if they're not smart enough to know what debt is, then they're not smart enough to go to college. Maybe they didn't learn enough in high school. <laughs> well, we've got a, we've got a good debate. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. It's my turn again. It's my turn again. Okay. You have to go real quick for a little rebuttal, and then we'll take it. Well, I, yeah, I mean, they've, they've all both spoken a lot longer than I have, so I, 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 I feel I need to go. <laughs> okay, first of all, I, I do believe there, the student has to take a certain amount of responsibility when they sign on that line, and that's why I say I can see maybe partial forgiveness, but they, 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 they've been sold a bill of goods, I'll admit that in a lot of cases, but that doesn't relieve them of all responsibility, okay? I'd like to comment one thing on, uh, on what Michael said. Well, I believe that 
maybe not free educational system, but we certainly need to bring down the cost of education. I'm yeah. currently paying for two kids in college and have paid already paid for two, okay? And it, again, it, this industry is very self-serving. I mean, they, they hold the ideals of, you know, you're gonna get an education and this is great. Their, their, first, their first concern is their bottom line, okay? When I have to pay $1,000 for books that have been made obsolete because they changed them a little bit so that book is no longer good so they can't sell the used ones and I gotta keep paying for new books each time. I mean, that's a racket. And we can get rid of things like that. And we could do things to bring the cut. There's many courses that could be taught online and we could have a national online university for all these courses that are basically the same thing that are cookie cutter courses. You know, not, there's some things that you can't teach that way, but we could use technology to dramatically bring the cost of education down. Okay, we have to, we, we have to do that. Because we can't, uh, like I say, uh, good education is priceless, but we can't bankrupt, our, bankrupt ourselves to obtain it. On another point that Michael raised about, you know, what he would do, I, I disagree. You, you don't go ask your constituents what you, they want you to do. I, I, I think I'm, I will share with you my philosophies, my ideas, and I will certainly consult with constituents. You know, if if I have questions and, and get their input. But in the end, it's it's up to the, the senator to then do what they think is is the best. Okay. It, I, that's why we're, it's a rep, representative dem, to d democracy. And if, if you, you listen to the things that I say and you like my philosophy and you agree with some of my issues, some of the things I say and you disagree with somebody the, that you say, all in all, I think he will do the things the way I think they should be done. You know? But not, you know, you, you can't go back and, and check with every constituent, uh, you know, um, on every issue, you know. Uh, so. All right, I think we have... Can I rebut the rebuttal? Ah! <laughs> 20 seconds. Okay, I'll make this real quick. Um, I, and actually, I, I do think that the idea of a free education is important, and I'll tell you why. It's not just about, and I'm speaking of somebody who was raised poor working class, who came from the housing projects, who had to, had to go get a whole lot of money to get educated to become a nurse. But this ain't about, again, this is not about me. It's about our broader society. Our society gets better when we have more educated people. Our society gets better when we have more doctors and more nurses, and more doctors and more nurses, or engineers or whatever, who come from poor working class backgrounds. That can give a whole different perspective on, on our education system, on our medical system, and, our, and on our every aspect of our society. That's why we give free education. And by the way, just for the record, I'm not a socialist. But that's part of the reason, because I'm not, I'm, not I'm going to be honest, I'm not a socialist. It's okay. But I do recognize many of what, what the Cuban Revolution was saying. Yeah. That's what they did. All right. that's what they, that's what they did. I have to make that point. That's why the Cuban Revolution put forward this idea, because it, it had brought the entire society upwards and better. And that's why I believe in free education. All right. I, I think just, you are second. Cousin Patrick and um, well, as an honor in order to use Musicians United for Save Energy, I have a question in um, respect to if going forward in the next 10 years, there's going to be a dialogue and some decisions made about nuclear power. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on um, whether we should have a guaranteed loan program for an industry that has some real serious problems, or is there all the other possibilities that we can look for for energy needs in the future? Well, um, well I'm, yeah. I'm traditionally starting trying, first. I don't yeah, I'm trying to be kind of uh, mixing it up. Let's let Mike start no. this time. No, thank you. Um, I am so completely, totally, absolutely, 100% opposed to nuclear power for so many reasons. It's not even funny. And here's, and here's where we're at right now with the nuclear power industry. Barack Obama is in large part owned by the nuclear power industry. The entire political process is owned by the nuclear power industry. And the nuclear power industry is very bad, it's very evil, and if you want to talk about just how evil it is, let's talk about Karen Silkwood. Karen Silkwood was allegedly, allegedly murdered by operatives from within the nuclear power industry. That's how evil these people are. 
Nuclear power is not only dangerous, it's stupid. There's this wonderful, um, if any of you old timers here, remember the show Mork and Mindy? With Mork? Where Mork was having this conversation with this investigative reporter she was having a roommate with, where she was trying to investigate a nuclear power industry. And this alien said, well, what do you mean if there's a leak? Well, just put on some nuke away. Just spray some nuke away on it. And she went, what do you mean, what's nuke away? And he went, what? You have nuclear power and you don't have nuke away? <laughs> <laughs> very, very fun, very cute little show, but it made the point. Nuclear power is inherently dangerous. And we don't even have to look at Fukushima. Never mind the disaster that's Fukushima. Even the disaster was Three Mile Island. So many potential disasters we have with nuclear power. We've got to get past nuclear power. We've got to get past this pretense of clean coal. Clean coal is a lie. There is no clean coal. We've got to create alternative, real alternative energy sources. And I will fight as a senator for that. Thank you. Okay, Tim. Well, we're dealing with things on a back end. I'm opposed to nuclear energy. But why do we need nuclear energy? That's the question. The real, the real equation is there's too many people. And we're using up the resources and we need the energy for all the people that we have. And we know that coal is not clean and we're running out of coal. And we just blow off some more mountaintops and destroy the environment that way. What we really have to do is look at reducing the population and then living on less. Because the more we consume, the more energy consumption, these electric lights, your heat, your air conditioning in the summertime. We need more energy efficient things. We can do it, but that's going to take a lot in this country to force corporations and others to look the other way. We're suckers for cheap energy in America. We're not paying for our energy. And as Mike said, you don't have to look at Fukushima, but one more earthquake in Fukushima, and you can write off the Pacific Ocean and the fisheries. And write off Japan, too, for that matter. If they have evacuated Japan, that's going to be a human catastrophe. So no, no nuclear power, but let's take a look at why we need power. There are reasons why there's more power plants needed. It's because of population. When I was at the Green Party Convention in Denver, Colorado in 2000, they needed eight more power plants in Colorado just to put up with the demand for power. Eight more in one state. Where are you going to get this energy from? It's got to come from someplace. Germany has proved that solar energy is possible to run. They have shut down their nuclear energy in Germany. It's going to take a tremendous amount in America to get us off our oil tea and our love of cheap energy. So we have to ask ourselves, we are going to have to do some real serious conservation on a serious level and take a look at our population and say, maybe not today is the day for air conditioning. Put on a coat, like Jimmy Carter said, wear a sweater, don't turn it up the heat. Because that's what it's going to take. And you're going to have people who are going to say in the big industries, the big corporations, GE, of course, that makes these and nuclear turbines is going to say, hey, we need energy. The people are calling for energy. We have this. Now, there are safe ways of making nuclear power, but we don't make them here. China is looking at thorium, which is a hell of a lot better. But we're not looking at it here. So I'm opposed to nuclear energy. But we have some other serious questions to get to in order to deal with the energy crisis that we're going to face. Thank you. Steve. As, as, as Tim mentioned, uh, there's a lot of potential for thorium, the use of thorium in nuclear power. And I think we should be pursuing that in, uh, along with, probably in cooperation with China, really. Uh, and that will offer a possible, you know, uh, partial solution to our energy problem. And I, I agree with Tim about we need to consume less. Yes, we do. Uh, but we are a consumer economy. 
and it's going to be a, a, a massive undertaking. It's going to take a lot of time to switch us to what I call a stewardship economy, where instead of uh, you know consuming our future, we start building and putting back for the future, which I think we can do. Uh, and I think it's possible that as humans, we can put back more than we take out. You know, I, and if, if we can't, we're doomed. I mean, that, I mean they're, they're just the, physics, the, the physics of it is we're doomed. You know? So uh, being a hopeful person, I, I, think, I think we have the ability as humans to actually put back. Uh, and so there would be more in the future. Okay? Uh, but we, in, the, in our country in particular, I mean, we're the, the biggest consumer nation, you know, debt-based consumption, and for all sorts of reasons, it's, it's a terminal economic model. I mean, it's, it's going to, if the, the resources, if the finite resources don't get us, the, the financial debt's going to get us, one, one way or the other. Uh, so we, we have to look for a different way, and it's going to take time. But this is why uh, I want to switch uh, my tax policy. I want to put a tax on consumption rather than have payroll taxes where you tax labor. You know, we need to tax the consumption end instead of encouraging, you know, in all the major parties are trying to encourage consumption. Well, this debt-based consumption is what's got us into this mess that we're in right now, and they're just taking us, trying to get us to drive quicker towards the cliff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to have to learn to consume less, and I've found, I, I've restored a lot of natural habitat on my property, and I've found personally that the rewards of stewardship, of building for the future, are much greater than the, reward, than the rewards of consumption. The consumption, that's just fleeting, and then you've got to consume more. If you build something that, that's enduring, that, that's where there's real rewards and real satisfaction. And if we could build you know, an, an energy infrastructure that is green, I mean, it's, we're not there yet. We're a long ways from being there yet. And I, I hope solar, they've, they've got a handle on solar in Germany. I, I'd like to see that, uh, but we're, a, but I'll tell you one thing that's not going to get us there, and that's corn ethanol. No. Which <laughs> is, is a, you know, that we paint the label green on something, and then we get the government to subsidize it and just blow money in. We don't make any progress, and it. it's, you know, a false promise. No, we have to go, we have to convert to a stewardship economy, and it's going to be tough, but we have to start now because we're heading for, towards that cliff faster and faster all the time. Thank you very much. Anyone have any quick comment? Uh, everyone's against corn ethanol. <laughs> I would say hemp. You know, you know, hemp is a great biomass. Oh well, yes, yeah. We have great alternatives out there, but. All right. Well, I'd like to hear each uh, candidate's opinion or viewpoint on health care. It's pretty obvious that Obamacare is not universal health care. I happen to be for universal health care, but I'd like to have each candidate kind of go in as to how we change, what we change, the costs, what's going to have to transpire to get, you know, uh, health care as a right for everybody in the world, but at least I'm living in America, so for us. Oh, see, I was at, I was at uh, Tim this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who should we go first? Uh, okay, now, if, if you were a, a Republican, you would say you already have a right to health care, you just have to pay for it. Uh, and, and, and we have to work, and we know Obamacare is, is just a, a giveaway to the insurance companies, and it's going to cost all of us more than uh, he tells us. Uh, I would favor more of a Medicare for all system. Uh, we can do that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I understand that uh, Obama came out for, well, a single payer type system and then let it fall by the wayside because you're know, fighting money. Uh, and and you, you're saying the right things. You're saying we have to have a change of heart. Uh, in order for everyone to get our universal health care in this country, We've got to force our politicians to go against the corporations. Mm -hmm. 
because they're fighting not only the insurance companies but big pharma, mm -hmm. and that's a giveaway. Uh, and these uh, these people run. I mean, I mean, you have to understand we don't have elections; we have auctions, and and, and they go to the highest yeah. bidder. Yeah. And and what happens is if you're in a state that has a big pharma. You're going to get a lot of donations, and you're going to get pressure from lobbyists, and that's exactly what happened in the Obama health care debate. Those of us who are for, let's say, single payer or Medicare for all, don't have big lobbyists because we're people. We're just trying to make common sense out of a bad situation, and they don't care about your bad situation because their objective is to keep you sick because that's how they make money. That's how the health care industry makes money, is by keeping you sick, keeping you in the hospital. If you're fine and healthy and out, they're not making any money. So we have a complete system that basically feeds you junk food, gets you sick, and puts you in a hospital so you can pay. Ruin your whole life savings, go bankrupt for medical bills. I had a broken leg two years ago. It cost $26,000 on, on the bill. Now, obviously, I had health care and I was able to pay. $26,000 for a freaking broken leg? That seems ridiculous. If anything, we should have health care where we can go to a doctor and say, okay, broken leg is $500. Okay? It's going to cost you that. So you know when you go in what the cost is, he can basically fix it. If it's bad, maybe $750, but that's the price range. Broken arm, maybe $250 to $400. We can pay it off then. We can say, okay, send me the bill. I'll gradually pay it off. It's relatively easy to do. These people know how to do this. This is not rocket science. How long are we fixing broken legs and broken arms? We've got to come to a conclusion in this country that we deserve what we're paying for. We pay far more than any other country in the world. We're the only industrial country in the world that doesn't provide health care for its people. We have to come to the conclusion that, hey, corporations, get out of my life and tell the politicians we don't like it. Nobody likes Obamacare, as far as I know. Some of the people are liking it because it's, well, it covers the people that are uncoverable, but why is that? Why don't we cover everybody? It's no fault of your own if you get sick, perhaps, or no fault if you're born deformed or, or have some other anonymity. We should be taking care of people. But we don't because we go for the money. It's capitalism in America. It's all for the bucks. It's all for the big boys. And you ain't big boys. And so therefore you don't count. So we have to come to the conclusion as a society that we need to either provide for people or we're gonna to have to be like the Republican debates and cheer for when people are killed or cheer for when people are sick and injured. And I don't think that's the society we want to be in. But we're going to have some very serious decisions in the next few years as Obamacare comes online by 2014 and the economic situation being what it is. That we're going to have to come together as a society and change it. As I said, I would prefer Medicare for all. That would cover everyone. You pay in it. If you're a citizen, you get it. Play pure and simple. And they should have basic coverage for everybody. A simple, once a year kind of physical. If you got problems, okay. Maybe you'll have to pay a little bit more. But it should be pretty easy. Well, Let's thank stop. you, Tim. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go to Steve on this now. First of all, I just love that we have auctions, not elections. <laughs> I'm going to use that one. <laughs> um, universal health care, single payer, Medicare for all, whatever you want to call it, it's essential. For a number of reasons. One, uh, justice demands it. I mean, if, if uh, a senior citizen has the right to Medicare, the newborn is just as entitled. You know, should, has, should, has justice demands that we provide it for the newborn too, and then everyone in between. Okay. But more than that, uh, ec the economics demand it too, because currently, in the current system, the American worker is the one basically putting the bill for health insurance, you know, through payroll taxes, and then that which pays for Medicare, and then by having the employer be forced to pay for the health insurance for the employee. Okay, we're destroying jobs. 
Okay. The, in, the employers, pr producers can avoid the cost of health care as well as Social Security. I include so, you know, Social Security by taking those jobs overseas. Okay. And the American consumer can avoid those costs by purchasing things that are produced overseas. The American worker doesn't have that option. Okay. So we have to have universal health care, Medicare for all, but we have to pay for it again with a consumption tax. We can't be taxing the workers of this nation to pay for that. We, we have to tax the consuming end. Okay. I, I want to encourage jobs, not destroy them. And another thing, if we have, med if we have a federal program for Medicare for all, okay, then you could use the purchasing power of the federal government to bring costs down. We have to, there has to be co-payments. People have to have incentives not to go to the doctor every time they get the sniffles. I mean, I feel a person should be willing to pay what they pay to go out for dinner for, you know, for an office visit. And if they need major surgery, I, sh I feel they should be able to pay what they'd spend on a vacation maybe. Okay, so there has to be, there has to be economic incentives not to waste it. Okay. But an an another benefit of having a, a federally sponsored health care program for all. Think of the cost savings to the schools, the universities, will be able to bring the cost of education down. How about to local governments? You know, health care is the, is the biggest cost that these, these branches of government have, these local branches of government have. If that is taken care of at the federal level, we will free up all sorts of money that they will then have to spend on education. You know, on environmental projects, you know, parks. Uh, it's a win win situation all the way around to have a universal health coverage for everyone. Thank you very much. Michael. Well, I love it. I disagree with Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I say that is it's actually a very minor. Um, disagreement obviously um, I, obviously look I'm a registered nurse I know exactly how broke the healthcare system is I know exactly how corrupt the entire medical industrial complex is uh, the disagreement I have with you Stephen this is just a very brief one is that you talk about everybody should have to make a $10 co-payment because after all you know if you can afford to go out for dinner well you know what poor folks can't afford to go out for dinner if you're poor, you don't have the luxury of having that money to go out for dinner or to make that. I, no, and I, I, know, I know that. I just had to say that. I just had to say that. But no, um, but you know, you guys, look, here's the bottom line. The answer to this health care crisis that we're facing is universal single payer health care. It's, it's just that simple. It's the most obvious, the most logical, the most cost effective, everything. So that's the solution. And anybody with even half, a, half an ounce of common sense knows this. So we need to look at why we don't have universal single-payer health care. The auction. The auction, <laughs> exactly, which is the whole point. That's exactly my whole point. Um, and in fact, we, somebody, somebody mentioned about um, Barack Obama. Senator, um, Senator Obama, Illinois Senator um, Illinois, was fully supportive of single-payer health care. And then when he became the president, the biggest, most obvious obstacle to getting single payer health care was the Obama administration. I watched the, uh, the hearings that were going on, the health care committee hearings. And I watched as corporate executives were testifying. And I watched as big pharma executives were testifying. And then in the middle of that, in the audience, you had doctors and nurses all standing up and saying, why are we as supportive of single payer health care? Why are we not even at the table? And they had a point of saying it over, and it was like seven or eight of them, I believe, were actually physically ejected from that, those committee hearings on the health care, on the Obamacare um, run up. So the single payer health care people were actually very deliberately and consciously excluded. And when these doctors and nurses stood up and said, why is that? They were all physically ejected from the chambers. And that's what actually happens called the Bacchus hearings. Look it up. So the reason that we don't have single barrier health care is because the Democrats and the Republicans don't want it. You'll have an occasional elected official will make noises, 
but how much they love single payer health care, but it's not feasible, it's, you know, any one of a variety of, of series of excuses. That's the problem. I don't believe in looking at problems. I believe in looking at solutions. And our solutions is looking right north from us. In Canada, about 50, 60 years ago, you had two parties completely corrupted by the corporate system up there. And then suddenly enough people got together. And what I'm talking about is why third party politics is so critically important. In Canada, they had two parties. And these two parties were opposed to any sort of single payer health care system. And then, what was the name of the governor from Canada? What's his name again? Anybody remember? Um, he's famous. Trudeau? No, 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 not Trudeau, no, no, no. Um, earlier than that. Yeah. The, the, I, I'm sorry, I forget, I forget the, and the guy's my hero, too. <laughs> this man became the governor of Canada. Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. Yeah. Thank you. Prime Minister. The prime, no, actually, he became no, the, the governor the of that, and he was with a new party called the NDP, the New Democrat Party. And this third party politics forced the issue of single payer health care onto the agenda in Canada. And from that, was enough pressure applied, and they were actually calling not for single parent health care. They were actually pulling, calling for the same thing as what the British had, full, complete medical coverage, similar to the Cuban system. And that's what caused Canada to have single parent health care. So that's why third party politics, outside of this rotten, corrupted system, is so important. It is so critically important because it's what got the Canadians a single parent health care plan. It wasn't the, uh, their version of the Democrats and Republicans playing kitty cat with each other, pretending they hated each other, which is what they were doing then. It was an actual real opposition to the system party. Actually gathered enough organizational skills together to actually oppose that system and force the Canadian system to, to actually answer what they were talking about. Just like, for example, that's what gave us Social Security. Let's not kid ourselves, folks. We didn't get Social Security in this country because the, the, the political establishment were looking for our welfare. They were frightened of the alternatives. Same thing here with single payer health care. How we're going to get single payer health care in this country is the same way as what they got in Canada. By the building and the organizing of an actual, real, strong, effective third party system as part of a broader mass movement for for health care and for all the issues that we talked about. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right, we want to get to a few more questions. I am Norm Weinstar, Okanaski, former grassroots party candidate for a year. But anyway, I got more votes than the Republican candidate. But um, <laughs> the biggest issue that I think none of you are going to be senator because single winner take all, it's called, excuse me, winner take all system. We need instant runoff voting. Otherwise, it's always going to be two parties because of the way that winner-take-all works. And I know it's not a U.S. Senate issue. They don't get to decide it. But we're never going to have any third-party winners until somebody does it, and, and it has to be in the States. So I just wanted to see if you have any discussion about Let's that. Let's let Steve start first. Since well, the States we, run the elections, they have to do it in the States, but it will affect the U.S. I, I agree we need instant runoff voting. I mean, undoubtedly. It, that's one, that's, that's the beginning of the election reform. We also need to uh, not allow uh, elected officials to request or accept bribes as they are right now. We, we have the FEC that regulates this, this corruption, but we have to eliminate that con cor corruption. Once, once a person's elected, they have a job. And if, if they go out and solicit a, contrib a contribution from anyone or accept a contribution from anyone, they should be charged with corruption. Okay? They could, they, they, the power of incumbency is more than enough to give them a fair shot at being elected. But I will correct you, we have, I mean, in this, this state, we did elect a third party candidate. And it, it's possible, but you're you're right. We we do need and to have. And they did charge the guy when it was a Green Party candidate, Dean Zimmerman. But other than that, they but, don't yeah. Charge but we do. <laughs> but we, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do need uh, rank choice ballots or you know instant runoff voting, whatever you want. Uh, you know, I'm I'm fully in support of that. I I would also actually like to see uh, a primary for all the independent candidates so that 
any candidate who was independent could just register for the primary, and then they would the winner of that primary would then receive some funding to, to then run a campaign and go up against the, the ruling parties. You know, uh, but that way you can narrow. You know, because there's there's three of us here, and, and you know what? We have a lot of we share a lot of common ground, and we're kind of run. You know, we're kind of running against some of the, ourselves to a certain extent. Where if we had had you know had this yeah yeah if we had had a, a party for independent candidates and I and I kind of although I, I like the independence party I mean they, what they supposedly stand for any what they supposedly stand for but um, I kind of view that 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 primary as kind of serving that function you know if we had all gone into it at, on the ballot then there'd be one of us here and we wouldn't be you know, kind of splitting the, that, that independent vote. And so I would like to see, a, you know, basically an independent primary for, you know, all candidates. Let, the, let them bring forth whatever ideas they want and hope that the cream will come to the top. And then they, was, uh, they get a little bit of state, a little bit of government funding to go up against our ruling parties. Hmm. Tim? Uh, well, I uh, tend to agree. Public financing would be wonderful if we can get rid of the corporate money that's in our auctions. Um, also, proportional representation would be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, that way, all the minor parties would be at least served if they got a percentage, uh, like they do. Well, however, we don't have a parliamentary uh, uh, form of government. Um, proportional representation does work around the world, and it should work here to bring us more democracy. Uh, we definitely need to look at our election laws, like the uh, electoral college that's going to elect our president. It's not we who elect the president, folks. It's not by popular vote. So it's done with electoral college votes. We need to get away from that and go through either a winner-takes-all system and some sort of proportional representation so that everybody can be represented. And then you can work things out amongst yourselves and make for a better country. When you said winner take all, did you mean uh, instant runoff voting? Well, instant runoff voting is, is fine, yeah. Well, I was just saying the winner take all, basically, over. But yeah, I would support instant runoff voting. Yeah. Michael. I actually um, disagree on a number of uh, levels and for a number of reasons. Uh, and just to start off talking about IRB, instant runoff voting was instituted in Minneapolis. And we need to look at what the political establishment did when we had IRB. None of the candidates running, like for instance, Mayor Archie Ryback, had people chasing him to have a debate. He refused to engage in any debates. And the political, here's the most important part of this question. The political establishment in this town made sure that nobody knew there was an election. In the last, in the last um, election here in Minneapolis, we had the lowest in the first time we ever had IRB. We had the lowest turnout in, since 1919. Oh, no, actually, it was, no, it was 19% voted. It was the lowest turnout since 1911. But I just want to say Minneapolis is a totally different type of voting system than our normal one of the state. So yes, it's IRB. Using it in a state election, it's completely irrelevant in my opinion. So. And it's a different voting system completely. I ran well, in system. So did I. I know. Yeah. And, but my point being is that when you have something like IRB, the political establishment finds ways to make sure that we're still suppressed. And that was a form of voter suppression, is what the Democrats did in Minneapolis in the city council races, and it's unquestioned that's what they did. And in my opinion, they did it very, very deliberately. Now, with, now having said that, another reason that I actually don't um, agree with even the premise of the winner-take-all system third party people can't win. I disagree completely and entirely. After all, we have a United States, we have um, a governor from Minnesota who won. Well, yeah, it's theoretically, but it's such a small possible. And? I agree, it is theoretically possible. And I'm not talking about Governor Vest Jesse Ventura. I'm talking about Floyd B. Olson. Floyd B. Olson. Not only did Floyd B. Olson win the governorship, but the Labor Party here in Minnesota actually won the House and were two, two um, seats shy of owning the Senate. And these people were all openly socialists. 
So when we talk about, when we talk about, um, you know, well, third party candidates can't win, I actually don't believe that at all. That was a totally another time too, so sorry. Yeah, and we're, and, we're, and we're headed back towards that time, which is where my head's going with this. We are, we are facing crises. So you support the winner take all system of I, state voting? I actually, I actually, I, I hear what you're saying, and the answer, the simple answer is no, because we do need an actual proportional represent, representation. We need that PR, right? That's what we need. But here's the problem: we're not going to get it as long as the two parties have a stranglehold on the system. And the people who have the power to change that is we, the people. And I will say to you most respectfully, and, and by the way, it's just I'm going to talk about my own personal strengths on this Senate campaign. Here's, how, here's where we're at right now, right? And, I, and I've said this to my, my supporters many times. In the American Revolution, and I'm talking about the Senate race now, in the American Revolution, how many people supported the British? 33%. How many people didn't give a rat's patooey one way or the other? Didn't care, no comment, no opinion. About 33%. How many people supported the Revolution during the time of the American Revolution? Never mind all the problems of the re revolution. Yes, we're a bunch of rich white guys, and yeah, yeah, all that stuff is all true. <laughs> but my point being is that at that time, 33% of the American population supported the goals of the American Revolution. Who won? Who won? What we're talking about is the building of an actual movement of people willing to break free I know who lost. from this they rotten. Yeah, and my sister. My, my wife is native. Domination won. That's what won. And, and the slave owners won. I agree. And, and by the way, my wife is native, as you know. She's a Jew. I think you're a Jew too, right? Yeah, my grandma was. Yeah. Well, then you're a Jew too. <laughs> um, and my wife is native. And and all you said is all very true. But I'm not talking about the actual American Revolution. I'm talking about the principles behind the American Revolution. Is that a determined minority were willing to actually fight corporate power? At that time, their power was the, was the corporation called the British Tea Company, which is who they were really fighting. And this small, determined minority actually changed this country. Yes, a lot of it's for the worst, especially if you're a native. Yes, I totally understand that. But my point being is that taking that goal and that example shows that we have this mindset that third-party candidates can never win. So why should we even try? Well, I disagree. Marijuana can never be legalized, so hello. I disagree. I'm, I disagree 100%. I mean, I disagree. Say, See, I disagree 100%. Yes. I believe marijuana I can be legalized. I think this tool, instant runoff voting, would be a tool against that two-party domination. Then I'm all for all right. it. I'm all for it. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, do we have another question? Sure. My name is Carol Palin, and I'm just a little bit confused about this whole home foreclosure versus banking industry, probably because I am from Minnesota, so I'm familiar and have read that um, Occupy Minnesota has actually won a court on three separate occasions. That six. banks have six total now. Six total. Yeah. That banks have illegally foreclosed on homeowners. Yeah. And I have emailed my political representatives, like my Senator Klobuchar and Mark Dayton, and they don't answer me. And I, so I want to know, is this true? And if it is true, and if the banks are crooks, then does that, is that the same as saying that white collar crime is now legal? Now? Because it is. Yeah, now. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, this is so, um, if, I know, laugh if you want, but for me that I'm is so my idea. confusion. Because this is, because I hear about these homes, these recent the court cover cases. Off, get it? And I'm not, well, I'm asking the question then, so these men are here running for Senate. So um, I wanted to know your response to that, and then what you would do if I voted for you for Senate, how you would approach that issue. Let's Mike, I think it's your turn to start. Um, thank you, Carol. You're welcome. <laughs> Wonderful question. Um, and, and by the way, just for the, just for the record, yes, white collar crime is reality. It's been going on for a very, very long time. I ask, is it now legal? Because, you know, executives from Enron were jailed and he had the whole Bernie Madoff thing and the Tom Petters, and so a lot of these people were jailed, so now banking seems to be an exception here. So that's where my confusion is coming yes. in. So. The, the simple answer to the question is, is that technically it's still against the law, but like every law there is in the books, 
it's not the book, it's not the laws itself, it's how they're applied. And the laws are always applied unequally. All you have to do is be black in this country, you know that's true. We live in, we live in a society where the judicial system is not fair, it's not applied fairly at all on any level. And yes, the bankers are getting away with the stuff, and the reason they're getting away with it is because our elected officials are allowing them to. And in fact, if you want to talk about the thing that horrifies me the most, if I have to go into this, is that um, the National Defense Authorization Act. Because anybody who doesn't know what that bill is, let me tell you just how bad it is. It's so bad on so many levels, but on this point alone, President Obama and 93%, 93 of the senators, including Senator Klobuchar, voted for this bill called the National Defense Authorization Act. And this bill has taken the very principles of the rule of law itself and made it null and void. The rule of law is, is that you have the right to face somebody who accuses you. That's what the rule of law is. That's not going back to the Constitution. That's going back to the Magna Carta from the 1200s. And that we have been now brought by that legal ruling have been brought back to even from before the Magna Carta, where we don't have the right to face our accusers. So when you talk about the rule of law now, the rule of law no longer exists. The government has been given the legal opportunity, the legal ability to intern American citizens without a trial. So what you're saying is true. Yes, the bankers are getting away with it. And they shouldn't be. And I can guarantee you that as a US senator, I will fight tooth and nail, not just to make sure that the bankers are exposed, but to make sure that the politicians who are protecting the bankers are equally exposed from the wrath of we the people. This is the start. This is just the start of actually trying to take over this government so that it becomes our government instead of theirs. That's all this is. One senator by himself is not going to change anything. Two senators, Bernie Sanders, who gets a little bit of fire up his back, suddenly starts to create some movement. Then you start reaching across the aisle to other crazy senators who understand this, like, like um, um, Ron Paul's son. And all of a sudden you've got this weird coalition going on talking about bringing our country back and bringing back the rule of law and making sure these bankers are brought to jail the way they should be. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Tim, what do you think? Well, it starts with the, I'll try to answer the question uh, as to, opposed to running off on NDAA and other things. <laughs> But it would seem that, based on your question, yes, it's okay to get away with fraud, uh, depending on how much money you have. Uh, we can look at Lloyd uh, Blankenpine, the, the person who uh, was governor and senator of Massachusetts and personal friend with Obama who took MF Global and ran it into the ground and took people's money, mm -hmm. rehypothecated money, and it's all legal because it's ran through banks in London. And if you have not paid attention, uh, you may have heard of the LIPOR scandal. Yeah. LIPOR is the London International Banking Rate in which it wasn't necessarily Barclays that got caught, but there were 16 banks that decide the interest rate around the world. And your interest rates on your credit cards, your home loans, your car loans, everything is decided by 16 banks at noontime when they want to make some money. It's fraudulent. The whole banking system is fraudulent. Our whole money system is fraudulent. The Federal Reserve is not a corporation of America. It's a private banking cartel. I know that. Twelve separate banks. They get by with it because they're the government's little money machine. You can't interrupt the money machine. As they said, they're too big to fail. <laughs> they need to fail. It's not the fact that somebody else couldn't do a better job, but there's connections. And that's what we're faced right now. We're faced with a global economic situation that we have no control over. Should tomorrow Greece decide to pull out of the Euro, all hell will break loose. Yeah. Should Spain or Italy go the way of Greece or Portugal or Ireland, the pigs countries, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Any one of those pulls out the euro, we're toast. Because there's tons of derivatives. Those mortgages that got bundled up and sold. All those things that are part of the problem. 
that they created the fraud when they bundled up all those mortgages and sold them to your pension programs. This economy is teetering on the brink of disaster. And fraudulent? Oh, sure. To get by with it? Sure. White collar criminals are getting by with tons. And you can go back to the Bush administration, you can go to the Obama administration, who've cut investigators, who've cut the SEC, who've cut people working, who've cut the federal, and who's in charge? It's the Justice Department. Oh, Mr. Holder, what a wonderful guy. <laughs> Yes, indeed. We'll give guns to the Mexicans and screw you over your houses. We don't care. <laughs> That's basically the story in America today. Yes, they're getting by with fraudulent, illegal things that you and I would go to jail for, but they walk. Too big to fail. Until we stop them. Um, and in the last six, year, six years, you know, we've had TARP which was basically a big bailout of the financial industry. And now we've had uh, QE1, 2, QE forever, whatever. Uh, bailout of the big banking system. The, the financial industry has recovered, okay? I mean, they're making money again, but we're still down three and a half million jobs, okay? Basically, the financial industry, the banking industry, the real estate industry has been running a great big Ponzi scheme. And unfortunately, we're all invested. And they're doing everything they can to keep it going longer. I mean, they're, they're putting their hole, they're covering up holes in the dike here and there, but eventually it's, it's gonna fail. And uh, the question is, when it fails, uh, what do we want to get it? We're going to have to have a plan for what to do then. I mean, I, I personally would have rather had the failure occur six years ago and then use all this money that has been created to stimulate jobs from the bottom up. We have bailed out our financial masters at the top. Our, you know, our economic masters, we have bailed out. They're doing just fine. Uh, the, you know, the, the richest percentage are, are gaining money well. There's fewer jobs we're not, you know, than there were, were, and we spent all this money just basically bailing out the financial industry that is ruling us. Uh, yeah, they get, they're, they're getting away with crime, but unfortunately, so many of us are invested in this that we're, we want it, you know, we want it to keep going too. We have, we've mortgaged our, our house to 150% of the value so we could go out and consume all sorts of junk. Uh, it's gonna end and it's not gonna be pretty. Uh, but when we have to, again, when, we, when it does end, we have to then start rebuilding from the bottom up instead of, again, as we've been doing the last six years, bailing out the top and hope it trickles down. So just to be clear then, I'm not sure I heard anybody say that they would ever jail a banker. Oh, I would. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't ask us if we would jail us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, can we answer that question honestly? But, uh, what we would, would you, you'd ask if crime had committed. Yes, crime has commi been committed. Well, crime then is a they They're controlling the... The judge and the jury, you know, they own them. They, they own Congress. They own the administration. I mean, they're the, they contribute more to the, to the candidates than any other industry. I mean, they're, 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 they're by, they dominate every aspect of our life. They, they've got all of us someplace where we, yeah, where we don't want them. <laughs> Look at the Obama administration and the amount of people that come from Goldman Sachs. Yeah. <laughs> It's a it's a revolving door. Well, they were door. just in the in the Bush administration before it. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a revolving door between the Fed and the and the Congress and the and the banking industry, and one hand greases the other until we stop it. Yes, we'd all probably jail these people somewhere. It, it, fraud's being committed. It's against the law. Like I said, you and I would be in jail. They're destroying our nation. The Federal Reserve <laughs> is printing money, causing inflation, the invisible tax. 
ruining your dollar's worth. It, it's, we are in an economic uh, basket case, basically. We're just waiting. And that's all they're doing. That's what he said. They are printing money so they can paper their losses. Mm -hmm. That's all they're doing. They're covering their ass. They're not helping anybody. The banks are just covering their butt. They've got so much money lost in mortgages and derivatives. They're just taking the money and shoving it in there to pay off their guys who come looking for them. There's not enough money to pay all the debts in the world. There's it's just really too bad we do not have a couple uh, the incumbent Klobuchar to defend Gary Colder. <laughs> I was actually just going to say that, you know, um, no, these are some very, very serious questions that's being asked. Very serious questions. And while I agree they're not the same sort of fluffy questions you might get at the NPR pretend debates, but it is unfortunate that Senator Klobuchar, or indeed Kurt Bills, the so-called liberty candidate, so-called, is not here to answer these questions. It's very unfortunate. All right. Uh Mr. Schmidt. Well, I'm not running for anything, but I just like to say about, you know, every kid in this country, born in this country, owes $60,000 because of the national debt, so maybe we should just give them an education. Um, um, and another commentary, Minnesota's share of the so-called defense budget this year is $25 billion. And if you took one of those billion, you could give a $10,000 scholarship to 100,000 students. Okay, and my question is, I mean, the total, I mean, the underlying every other problem we have is money and politics, and how, how do you see going forward in some fashion to get money out of politics? All right, let's start with Steve. Well, as, as I said earlier, once you're in office, you don't accept any money from anybody. That, that's, I mean, everyone has free speech. If the, if the corporations want to spend the money, I guess we can't stop them. They have free speech. But we don't have to let the politicians accept bribes. I mean, that's corruption, pure and simple. They are, work, they are employed. They have a job working for us. It's not not their job to go around and collect campaign contributions, uh, you know, and they're using our dime to do it. I mean, when the president goes to some 10,000 uh, plate fundraiser, he's taking Air Force One, he's, you know, it costs millions of dollars, then he ties up traffic for five hours someplace, <laughs> and this is so, this is so he could get his corrupt money, you know, this is to, so he could be bought off. We don't have to allow this. Yeah. It's that simple. What's worse is they're not governing while they're doing that. Yeah, no, they're not. Yeah. And, and once they get into office, the first thing that they do is start raising money again. Now I'm elected, now I can really cash in. I can really build up my war chest. You know, that's not what governing is about. All right, Michael. Uh, Senator Klobuchar has got nine and a half million dollars in a campaign war chest. That's nine and a half million reasons why she's not working for us. Kurt Bills, and by the way, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, here Kurt, but um, <laughs> Kurt Bills, the Republican, has got a war chest of about a half a million dollars right now. All right? So when we talk about corporate money being in politics, and I've heard groups like Move to Amend say, we need to petition our government to stop taking corporate money. And the problem with that approach is that how can you how can you petition somebody who got there because of corporate money? And that's been my that's been my statement to move to a man for quite some time now. And they don't talk to me anymore. Here's what I say is that the best here no here's it's a big dirty secret. The very best, most effective way to get corporate money out of our electoral system belongs with us, we the people. I stop voting for it. It's really up to us. We, the people, have the right and the responsibility to get corporate money out of politics. We shouldn't try and ask them to stop taking corporate money. We shouldn't even demand that they stop taking corporate money. We should say, Senator Klobuchar, you're fired. Mm -hmm. Kurt Bills, you're fired. 
President Obama, you're fired. Name the elected official that takes money to get elected from corporate money. And just for the record, Senator Klobuchar, her biggest campaign contributor is Target, the Target Corporation. Anybody that knows anything about how rotten Target Corporation is, they are very, very bad people. Mm -hmm. Never mind that nice, shiny image they put on. Money has corrupted our entire political process. And I will, I will advertise our campaign website right now where I'd like you to go there and look at our vision statement. Because we talk about this as part of a vision. This is not just a one-off campaign just to give a protest vote or just to like, you know, give, give it to the man and get my little protest. No, this is about building an actual democracy movement. <coughs> we are take, talking about taking on corporate occupied America. And let's be really clear about this. If you're a Democrat or if you're a Republican, you are the same as a Vichy government in, in Nazi-occupied France. For those of you who don't know who the Vichy are, the Vichy were the government officials set up by the Nazis to, take, to, to keep everything in place. <coughs> Excuse me. These elected officials are collaborating with the enemies of democracy. They are collaborating with the enemies of we the people. So it's up to us, ourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. It's up to us. We have the power to get corporate money out of politics. I stop voting for it. Thank you. <coughs> Ooh, sorry. Well, Mike likes to talk about things that are not real. Um, I have uh, <coughs> in the back there a thing about banking and the move to amend. Because as Mike doesn't understand, Move to amend does not mean voting, it means amending the Constitution. We must amend <coughs> the Constitution because the Supreme Court gave us Citizens United. As long as the court says the corporations are people and money is speech, <coughs> there's nothing we can do until we amend the Constitution to overturn Citizens United. We can vote all the hell we want, but as long as that law is still on the books, it's meaningless. <clears throat> so I would invite you, go back and pick up the information on Move to Amend and pick up the information on banking. Because if we do not change that system, we are doomed <clears throat> to basically follow the same. And as I said, we don't have elections, we have auctions. <clears throat> Well, I mean that's a, that's uh, that's a, that's I mean that's essential, but I mean the whole system was corrupt before right. that decision. I mean definitely, you know, it's a place to start. In the person on the end there. I ask, can I rebuff real quickly? Okay. Good. Most respectfully, Tim, I hear what you're saying, and this is what I've said to the move to man people because I've studied this stuff very, very carefully, very closely. The way to amend the Constitution is to get, I believe it's either two-thirds, I believe it's two-thirds of the elected officials to actually put forward an amendment to amend the Constitution. And here's the problem with that whole strategy, is that you're asking the people who got elected by corporate money to put forward amendment to the Constitution to get corporate money out of politics. And they're not going to do that. And that's what I've said to move to amend, is that that's why you, the move to man movement is doomed to failure because you're asking a system that is already co corrupted to its very core by corporate money to actually put in an amendment to actually get their corporate money out of the political system and they're not going to do it but Mike you're telling me that the people are the ones who do this and how do we demand of our representative to do something by voting them out of power and putting in people in power who do not take corporate money Good That's luck. the most effective way to get corporate money out of the political yeah, the system. Numbers, the you have to quit well. shopping and buying corporate goods. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, All right. You know, perfect. We have to stop consumption, as, as yeah. Stephen has said. And, it's, you know, we really have some serious problems that we're not addressing. Yeah. And that is the overpopulation and the fact that we do have a system that's falling apart. And we have to stop consuming and stop and, and eating local. 
Let's ask how many of you have enough food in your house for one week to survive without going to the grocery store. Well, I'm a farmer, so <laughs> I understand. But I, I mean, if you do, you already are a terrorist uh, based upon what the government says. But uh, if you're talking about withdrawing, you're talking about convincing a society that's based on cheap gasoline and 99 cent hamburgers. I mean, we can talk all the hell we want, I mean, the, the handful of us here, but we're not going to change anything unless we convince our neighbors and our people, our people next door. And go down the street and see the yes signs, the no signs, the Ryan signs, the, the Obama signs, knock on the door and say, what the hell are you thinking? Because they're not. They're not concerned. Right. We get what the legislators, we don't have an initiative. What we get is what the legislators decide for us. What do we get to vote on? Marriage and voter ID. Like those are the biggest freaking problems we face in this state. Somebody getting married and fraud, which doesn't happen. But with a voter ID, well, we'll make sure that doesn't happen. And I, somebody said you can't get a fake ID to get beer. What do you think you're going to do with voting? But. I digress. <laughs> All right. Let's well, I was uh, kind of you know, just leading into what he was going to say there, which is the fact that we got a room of 20 people here. Uh, with a room of 20 people, you, you can't get much done. There has to be more interest in seeing real change. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter. You know, you can't. You, you, if you take the money out of it, you take the corporate money out of the political process. There's going to be another way to for the the powers that happen to like to keep themselves in powers to do that. It's not until you actually have people that are interested in the process and interested in creating something greater <coughs> that you're going to get anywhere. How are we going to get people to pay attention to be a little more comfortable or uncomfortable? That's a good question, Bob. You gotta influence their kids, because kids, you can tell what to do. Parents are so stubborn, and they already have but a brain in their brain. But kids don't care these days. Kids don't care. All right, let's you go to you. You take the populations. Let's let the candidates answer here. They don't care. Whose turn is it? Is it they don't I like the fact that they just don't know. Tim's in. We can I don't know that. I don't mind. You know, I don't mind having a discussion out here as long as it's you know, civil. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm all. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think James is really asking a question there. I, I well, think, I mean, yeah, not so much. I'm just more. You know, I want to hear that reality out of someone, which is the fact that we are, you know, it, it's an uphill battle, and uh, it's not so it much about That's my son, my making boy. more, <laughs> making more rules to the political process. Because as a general rule, it seems that the more rules that the government creates, or the whatnot, the harder it becomes for the average person to have access to the process. I mean, if I run for something, I have to fill all the gazillion forms on where I'm making money, and if I happen to speak in front of someone I and make money doing it, it's a campaign contribution. You know, it's there's more rules isn't the answer. More involvement is is my statement. And let's let each of the candidates. And by the way, if you have questions, uh, I think we're going to close down in what 10, 15 minutes, and then have it more free. If people want to ask directly, is that is that about right? That sounds good. I'm yeah. I'm okay. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get a couple more questions in, and then we'll let people just more informally ask questions and hang around, have some more cookies, etc. So let's let the, each of the candidates. And I think Tim, actually, it was your turn to go first on that one. Yeah. How am I gonna get people involved? Uh, well, that's the big question. Um, we are filled with apathy. And we have been dumbed down by fluoridation over water and cheap food that's filled with GMOs and poisons, um, BFPs, being, you know, how many of us, I ask the question all the time, how many, how many of you here knew you were going to be born? What? Yeah, that's a question. How many of you knew you were going to be born? Well, did you? No. People that can be born beyond birth? Yes. Do you do you remember before you were born? Do you remember? I don't know. You were you were born before, right? Well, well, no one does because you just don't. Some people believe in reincarnation. Well, that's true. If you believe in reincarnation, but why do you believe this? This is the question. The question is, you're taught from the very beginning. 
You're basically born knowing nothing. You have to learn <coughs> everything. Your parents, your government, your church, they all lied to you. They all lied to you for one reason. For you to believe in them. So they could lead you. Why do we have nationalism? Why do we think of American exceptionalism? We're not exceptional. <laughs> Because we have to be born here. We're, we're, we're one race. We're one race. domination in history. Right. One race. The human race. One earth. We share it all. Why do we believe we're better than the Iranians? Why do they have to listen to what we say? And we're all flawed. We're all flawed. And the worst person in the world is inside of each and every single one of us. Because we're capable. We're all capable of doing the most evilest things that you can think of. Because a human being did it, it's possible that you could also be that person. So look at the people around you and look at the people that you meet on the street. Because the people around you are not the problem. They're already here. <coughs> the people on the street that aren't here to hear other candidates. I was just in St. Cloud yesterday, talking to the St. Cloud University, editor their paper. And I said, listen, there's 10 candidates on the ballot for president. You only talk about two. There are five candidates on the ballot for Senate. You only talk about two. There's 20,000 people in the state that put those people on the ballot. And those people count. But you don't care about those people. Because you only talk about Republicans and Democrats. And those are people in college. Those are your young people. When I was talking to Mankato State University editor, I said, where is the apathy? Why are you people so apathetic? We can read the same newspapers you do. Newspaper radages is going down. You get your news off the internet. Why in the hell can't you look up the Secretary of State's office and find out who's running? It's pretty freaking easy. You can Google Tim Davis for Senate, or Stephen William for Senate, or Michael Cavlin for Senate. It's easier than that. Well, it's easier than that, but I'm saying they have got to take the initiative. I can't force them to do it. They have to take the initiative. They have to be curious enough to want to learn something else. And if they're not curious, we can talk until we're blue in the face and nothing's gonna change. Because they like it the way it is. They're unaware that it's a big crisis, Well, it's, it's called the beautiful lie. You know, it's, it's something that, it sounds real good, but it, it's still a lie. And it, it's gotten us to this, this, to this point. You know, like we could borrow as much money as we want and never have to worry about paying it back. Or we could use all the resources we want and we'll think technology will, will solve our, all our problems. It's a, lot easy, it's a lot easier, you know, to, to believe the beautiful lie than to, to think of the sometimes ugly truth. It's, it's just part of the human condition. And, uh, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to try. I know what I know what we're all up against. But at least I could say at, at, at the end of the day when I, I lay down, I could go to sleep with a clear conscience that, that I've tried you know, to make the world a better place for my children and my grandchildren. And uh, that's all I can do. We, we all know, I mean, just the three of us here, we all know, we all believe, you know, that we're facing a, a dire situation. But we've all been able to keep our good humor at the same time somehow, you know? So uh, there's, I don't, I don't know if you all remember um, Arlo Guthrie's song, Alice's Restaurant. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, that's, <coughs> to me, that song is about, yeah, we'll, let's all speak up for justice, but let's be happy while we do it. We know there's a lot of rotten things out there, okay? And we may not, we may not succeed, but let's, let's soldier on with a song and sing loud and sing loud and uh, you know eventually maybe something will happen and uh, like I say I have I have a link to that on my website because I, I just view that as being really 
Yeah, we're, we're up against a lot. But let's, uh, let's soldier on with kind of a song in our heart and a smile on our face. And if nothing else, we'll be, be able to say we try. Thank you. Uh, Michael. You know, really interesting. Um, I got to tell you guys, I am so incredibly hopeful. And I'll tell you why I say that. If you look at the outside circumstances, you'd say, my God in heaven, it's never gonna, it's never gonna change. It'll never ever change. It's always gonna be this way. And you know who else was probably seeing that? People in Tanzania, right before a little stall man set himself on fire because he was so angry at the, at, in Tunisia. Tun Oh, did I say, oh, Tunisia, sorry, yes. I was like, what happened in Tanzania? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was no, I, of course, man, Tunisia. Where a little straw man set himself on fire because he was so angry at the fees he had to pay. And from that sprang the Arab Spring. And by the way, just while we're talking about this, imagine two years ago, Occupy didn't exist. The Occupy movement did not exist. And then suddenly it sprang forward. And one thing I, from my own personal experience, um, I will share this with you folks. I was raised in Northern Ireland. We all know Northern Ireland, a wonderful, beautiful, and also very angry resistance movement came into being. No matter how you feel about the issue of that, in Northern Ireland, in 19, this is part of the folklore in Northern Ireland, in 1964, the police came, the RUC, the police force, the British police force, came to the Falls Road in Belfast. And some one little man was out there selling a paper called The United Irishman. It was a tiny little paper talking about the issue of getting free from the British. That was in 1964. Cops came on the Falls Road, beat the living hell out of this man. Beat him up really badly, and the people on the Falls Road in Belfast turned down and, and looked away because they were so ashamed because they knew there was nothing they could do. Three very, very, very short years later, Northern Ireland exploded, our civil rights movement developed, and from that point on, till this day, even till now, the police force cannot go down the Falls Road in Belfast without having a fully armed British military escort with them. That's how things change, and they can change very, very quickly. And my, my point is, is that <clears throat> I'm a firm believer that, A, things are going to change, and they're going to change rapidly. <clears throat> and while we're talking about just this Senate race, right, you can call it uh, a Don Quixote, sort of a, you know, it'll never happen, yada, yada, yada. I'll tell you folks, I'm looking at the poll numbers. I've looked at the poll numbers that they're not talking about. Senator Klobuchar's numbers are going down. Well, if there was one of you instead of three, then there might be a chance against well, this, is where, like, this is where we're going with this. With the but this is just the start of a broader movement for democracy. My point being is that the Democrat, the Democrat incumbents numbers are going down, down below fifty percent. No. Yes, forty-nine percent. Well, which are told? Yes, me. they're not telling you this. And bills are going down too. Bills are going down too. Everyone I know doesn't yes. like well, maybe them. Three of you could run as one person. <laughs> we we are we are one. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, together, share the office. Is there any law against? Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. <laughs> Might I remind you folks of this? Stephen is an Independence Party candidate. The Independence Party is a major party in this state. Yes. Yes. The other two candidates that are major party candidates, Ms. Klobuchar or Mr. Bills, didn't invite him to any debates. NPR didn't invite him to any no. debates. And yet he's a major party candidate. Yeah. So party status has nothing to do with it either. But who owns who, And do you know why? Why? They're afraid of us. They are afraid of us. And by the way, just while we're talking this whole issue, the media, which as, as Tim successfully pointed out, refuses to talk about any other candidate but the Democrat and the Republican, refuses, flat out refuses. And yet, their numbers are going down. 
And I've heard a whole lot of discontent out there. People are tired of the two-party system, and they're looking for a way out. And what I'm saying is that, is that people are starting to wake up. People are starting to wake up. Is it the right that we want? No. But is there a very real possibility of an actual real democratic movement coming in this, in this state specifically? Absolutely. I'm convinced it's going to happen. I'm convinced of it. All right, last question. Oh, <clears throat> you had one. Let's take two more then over there, and then we'll do it informally. The far back? Speak slowly, my friend. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mustafa. Uh, first, I want to say to all of you, I want to thank you for have, having civil, respectful debate, unlike other folks when they go. Keep the awesome today. Yeah. Yes, you heard. <laughs> <coughs> um, second, um, Mike uh, mentioned about if you are back in this country, but some of us are back, then we are immigrants, then we are, we are Muslims. So, uh, um, what, what, what plans do you have to protect it? the rights of people like me. Every day we are harassed on the streets, we are arrested, we are investigated, we are for no reason other than who we are. All right, uh, Steve in the middle. How do you address racism, bigotry? Yeah. I, that's, that's a tough question. As, as senator, I, I could. I, you can't. I don't know that you could legislate that. I, I could only hope that I maybe some of us could lead by example. You know, uh, spend time in your community. There you go. Uh, that's. That's the big one. You know. You got to be there. Too. Yeah, I mean that's what 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 I see. You know, I, I don't know that it can be legislated, but I think. You know, I'd be, I'd love to, I mean, I, I'm from southern Minnesota. I used to live in south Minneapolis here, but this is, cha it's changed totally since I, since I've been here, you know, and, and I'd love to learn about your community. And that's, you know, that's what, if, as senator, how I feel I could best address that. But it, it's something that, it's going to take time. You know, but that's, that's what I'd offer. Can you hear Education helps, doesn't it? Yeah. But even at schools, I mean, people get educated, they start <coughs> learning other cultures, and that we're all different and the same. And people are afraid. Michael? That's what drives yeah. like me. Alaikum my friend. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I say it as a, as a, as a humble Catholic. Um, first of all, I'd like, before we talk about what you talked about, because I have an answer for you, a very specific answer. Um, I was uh, on the way home to my mother's funeral in uh, 1997. And myself and my brother were flying to Belfast from here in the U.S., where I was in nursing school. My mother was dying. And when we arrived at Heathrow Airport, uh, the British government officials took myself and my brother and held us. And they held us overnight under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. All right? Again, this is experience we're talking about. <clears throat> My answer to you, as Stephen correctly said, you know, there's nothing to do with the broader culture's racism apart from being an example. But as a United States Senator, I give you my word that one of the first things I will do as a Senator is I will put forward an act to rescind the Patriot Act. And part of that, when you put that, that act forward, because it's not just for you, by the way, it's for everybody here in this room. Because they started off targeting the Muslims. They're now surveilling all of us, the government. And when I put forward a rescind the Patriot Act, I won't just do it. You guys all know me. You know my style. I won't do it quietly. Any senator, Al Franken, Rand, Rand Paul, you name the senator, who doesn't come on board publicly supporting this rescinding of the Patriot Act, I will say, if you don't get on board with this, that means you are by definition becoming the enemies of the Constitution and this democratic republic. 
See, here we are in such a dire situation right now. We are in such a dire situation that we need people to stand up and say stuff like that. Because you know what? Those senators, including Senator Klobuchar, who did support the Patriot Act, too, and who did support the NDAA, have by definition taken that oath to protect and defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic, which they take, <coughs> their actions means that they are, by definition, enemies of the Constitution. They are the enemies they're sworn to actually fight against. And it's, again, this isn't just a Democrat-Republican thing. This is the entire political process. So as a senator, I will fight to put forward a bill to actually have the, the, the Patriot Act rescinded and the causes of the Patriot Act rescinded and national defense authorization and all of these rotten, rotten, unconstitutional, illegal bills that they put forward. And I will stand up and fight for, not just for you, Mustafa, not just for the Muslim community, not just for the Native community, but for the rights of all American people. Because we're all having our rights taken away from us right now by these people currently in office. This is the start of a movement. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you, Mustafa. Uh, I, I agree with Stephen. There's not much, uh, personally, that, that we can do besides meeting you, talking with you, and meeting your community. Uh, as a Muslim, I know you have your, your faith, and, and unfortunately, as I was saying earlier, people are fearful of things they do not know. They fear Muslims. <laughs> Michelle Bachman fears humans. <laughs> how do you get how do you get through these things? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's part, of, part of an educational thing. We have to educate people. As I was touching on earlier, we're all one race, the human race. We have many sizes, shapes, different colors, but we're all the same. So we must get to know one another, respect one another as human beings, and realize there are differences <laughs> But we all have one thing in common. We eat, we drink, we must have air. Sleep. We sleep. It's four things. Oh, <laughs> I didn't say three or four things. I, you know. And none of us can survive by themselves. Right. Yeah. So uh, legislation generally doesn't seem to work. As we know, the police <coughs> are their own worst enemy. I know one stands up to the police. Oh, yeah, they do. That's not true. Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> well, I didn't mean it. And then no one stands up to the police. Oh, but have you had any successes? <laughs> no. Yes. They will do what they need to do. And they have written into law everything they need to control this country. Yep. We get a little uppity. They'll have no problem with martial law. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Mike, Mike mentioned, uh, uh, I just and, and note that uh, they use against, it, against us and everybody else that they, they, they don't like. Right. Um, but not, not just that, you know, how did, you, you, you I, 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 I think you're right when you say it's about education too. But half of the Somali or East African immigrants, they are they live in this just one neighborhood, and the that neighbor, they segregate like Pantusar, they segregate from the wider wider community intentionally. They paid to that landlord a couple years ago all 125 million of taxpayers' money, and 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 Central Corruption was a big part of that, and I don't. I don't know why they did that, but I, you know, I thought about it. I think they just want to keep them there, so they don't know what's going on in in, in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, or in, in in this country. So I see kids who were born there, uh, grew up there, and all they know is those uh, four or five highlights that they live in, and and, and uh, they probably feel safe for that. It's, it's, uh, uh, 
uh, institutional segregation subsidized by, by taxpayers' money. So uh, I, w I was asking things like that mm -hmm. when I said, well, what, what plans do you have, what do you have for us? Well, that's, I'm glad that you shared that with me. I mean, that's part of, I've learned something that I wasn't aware of. No, I thank you. <clears throat> And the people in those buildings breathe exhaust 24-7 and their little kids get autism at very high rates because those high rises are right next to two freeways. freeways. Yeah. Yeah. And they first were filled up, I don't know if anyone else remembers this, but when they let people out of the mental wards, that's when they first filled up those buildings. Those buildings are for, have been used for different purposes. Like whoever needs a place kind of like ends up there and they came. And they took over that place. Can, can we turn it into a more informal thing now? Can I say one thing, sir? Okay. okay. Quick, really quick. Last question. Well, yeah. just really yeah. quick. Last question. Yeah, that's more observation, but it's also kind of a thought for everyone here. Is I wondered, as I think about all these things, what do our youth? What are they being taught in our schools? I don't know too much, except for when I talked to my nephew who's 18. Do they do know about that there's more to politics than is presented the conventional thing? Do they know more about you know different communities and cultures than what they taught in the, you know what I what I remember in high school? You know, how, what kind of education do we get? You know, going from like 20 and under. I, I think they're getting a lot of information about the different communities and the different cultures as far as politics. I mean, I think the, the, the media, the, you know, that just kind of takes and drowns everything else yeah, out. Yeah. I mean, we're, we, we are, we're fed politics the same way. They market politics the same way they market toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And that's the responsibility of the people to, to, to put an end to that, you know. Uh, so I don't know as politics what they're learning in school. But I do think as far as the, the different cultures, I, I do think they're trying to be very inclusive. I, I, just, I would really like to say that, you know, I don't think we have all these separations between people um, sort of naturally, and I think there's just the power structure scatters these fears out through the society, like you're gay or you're an immigrant or you're a government union worker, whatever it is to keep us divided, because they know if that we got together, they'd be history. You know, it's just <laughs> sort of, you know, I don't think it's just a natural thing to have all these fears it's produced. Right. And I just wanted to mention that if anyone uh, has video or even writes something uh, and is on social media, please post it to my page because I'm going to say how inspired I was after listening to the three uh, third other party candidates, not the two major party candidates tonight, and I think everyone in the room, since there's there's not that many of us, needs to do a hundred times more in terms of getting this out and reaching more people. Uh, and and hopefully we can we can sit in here a few years from now and have uh, an alternative to the two major parties. So thank you very much. For Oh, time right. to stand up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, the, well, the new here, uh, <laughs> we didn't get around to our civil liberties and civil rights.